very much for attending. Um, as your um, chair tonight, I'm really, really pleased to, uh, to be introducing this evening. Um, as I say, thank you very much for attending uh, to, to yourselves, uh, but also to our speakers. This referrals topic, of course, is really important for all of us. Um, this is, a, in a way, a generational uh, moment in the NHS and eye care. Um, we know that there are significant challenges around uh, recovery, around transformation, uh, and we know that eye care was already um, in significant um, need of change prior to COVID and, and never more so uh, since. We also know at the same time that one priority for NHSE is uh, digital solutions. Uh, and referral pathways have always been a, a big issue, a big deal for uh, optometry, uh, whether it be queues and other locally commissioned services or indeed uh, the GOS. Um, it's clear um, that the NHS can't, um, and eye care in general, can't anymore progress properly without people working collaboratively. Uh, working in silos is definitely uh, has to be consigned to history. So there's very much uh, focus on, on, on collaboration and this sort of broader system partnerships of which this is a really good example uh, this evening. And all of us here this evening, actually, uh, both panelists and uh, delegates, as it were, have a real responsibility to try and improve the system for our patients, but also for ourselves working within the system. Uh, we, we know that following the introduction of opera, this creates an exciting moment, an exciting uh, opportunity to um, think about the way referrals are managed and the interface of primary care and secondary care um, and the impact that that has on you all in primary care uh, and indeed those of us working in, in secondary care. Uh, and we know that we need to work collaboratively on, uh, on improvements. So this evening is really part of that improvement process, really, uh, an education uh, evening. And it's an improvement process going both ways. We know that those of you in primary care have frustrations um, and feedback that you'd like to provide uh, to primary eye care services and also to the eye hospital. And we know equally those of us in, in secondary care have ways in which we can uh, offer advice on referrals. And this needs to be done in partnership uh, in, in the right spirit with the uh, aim of improving uh, on uh, patient care. Um, so we have a, um, a, an ongoing collaboration with primary eye care services from Manchester Royal Eyes, but also with primary care optometry. And we have a group focusing and looking at trying to improve referral pathways. And this evening's event came about as a result of discussions uh, around the system uh, and what might need to change. And clearly nothing's, uh, to use Boris's phrase, oven ready. Uh, things need to be worked out to try to improve on things. So I'm going to, without any further ado, just introduce our panel. Uh, Matthew Jenkinson is here this evening, of course, uh, be well known to all of you from Primary Eye Care Services, but also significantly with his uh, LEHN and GM um, hats on. Paddy Gunn, our Principal Optometrist for Training and ed Education. Uh, Katie James, our MREH uh, Referral Relationship Specialist. Uh, Jez Parks, who will be well known to you as our uh, macular specialist lead optometrist, and Helen Wilson as our uh, lead optometrist within uh, acute services. And also here this evening, although not speaking, but able to offer her expertise from a glaucoma referrals perspective, uh, Amanda Harding. So um, just by way of housekeeping, we've got 60 odd plus people on, on, the, on the webinar uh, this evening. So it is a webinar format. It can feel a little bit distant because we can't hear you, but communication is very much at the heart of uh, what we want to achieve here. So there is the opportunity for you to use the Q&A facility. That'll be at the bottom of your screen. If you use your mouse, you should be able to use Q&A. So you can pose questions. And we have a half hour session at the end of this evening where we hope to try and deal with those questions. If you have feedback and comments, um, Katie's gonna keep an eye on the chat section of the comments. So that's not for questions. Use the chat for your comments and feedback. And we'll try and collate that too, because we recognize here that this evening is an opportunity for uh, a broader canvassing of, uh, of, of feedback. Um, so without any further ado, um, I'm going to stop talking uh, and I'm going to call on Matt to uh, share his screen. And Matt's going to provide us with um, key messages, really, and updates around uh, opera. Just one further thought I should have said is that as you think about these questions, in terms of the timing of when you submit them, given that we have a number of presentations, you may want to defer submitting your question till slightly later in the evening, because there is a reasonable possibility that your query will be 
answered. So we're not going to have questions at the end of each talk. It is a session uh, of its own accord right at, right at the end. So, uh, Matt, without any further ado, if I can invite you to uh, share your screen and, and speak. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Robert. And I'll, I'll just add, add to Robert's context setting a little bit, first of all, if that's all right. So, um, as Robert has said, so I am Clinical Director of Primary Care Services, and obviously that's uh, what the, the, the umbrella that I suppose I'm here to, to talk about opera. But from a GM perspective, being a local eye health network chair, and, and where have we been and where are we going in relation to the electronic referral systems across Greater Manchester? So, obviously, as you'll all be very aware, we had some funding through a pilot to commission uh, electronic referral system, along with another sort of a few other aspirational elements of electronic connectivity across primary and secondary care, and obviously we, we went into a healthy platform, and so Sajidem have withdrawn from the market. We've we've been able to to pick up on the fact that Opera was being used by primary care services, and, and take on some of the fuller functionality around that through some of the NHS integration into the electronic referral system and the NHS patient lookup, um, and more significantly around images. And obviously that is one thing I will focus on when we do look at uh, the Opera system very shortly. But I think also just setting the context for Manchester, so um, working very closely with MREH who have set up a lot of change in their sort of electronic referral system over the last uh, 12, probably planned for, for longer than that, 12, 18 months to move to uh, referral assessment service clinics. So these are referral assessment settings in, within ERS enable us to make referrals directly to uh, clinicians at Manchester Eye Hospital for your referrals to be uh, looked at, viewed, triaged, responses back. And I think that really is a, a significant opportunity for us in primary care to get that direct communication bypassing what we've always been used to in the past within Manchester, in particular of the uh, the gateway service up in, up in north of Manchester there. So I think that recognition that we the, the commissioners have worked with us, as have Manchester Royal and other hospitals across Greater Manchester, to allow us to have that direct communication on our referrals with, um, with, uh, with the clinicians at the hospital. So Opera, let me let me get my get my screen up. Um, Here we are. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go running through some of the very simple elements of opera. I'm sure you're very bored of hearing me talk about opera and giving you demonstrations on all things opera over the last few months. So um, you'll recognise this screen. I mean, hopefully I will just touch on one thing is that, of course, we do have our little bulletin section, which does change from time to time in relation to important messages. Uh, this current important message is, is one that we've been waiting for a little time is just allowing us to, to start to reopen the onboarding uh, onto the Opera platform. So if you do have practitioners that are working in your, in your uh, practice at the moment who are not able to access Opera because they haven't gone through that onboarding process, I'm pleased to say that it's now live and you can start inviting new practitioners to the practice. Whether that be referral only optometrists or optometrists who are looking to deliver some of the commission services across Greater Manchester, the process is now the same. So again, those of you who are familiar with Opera, we've got our signing, we've got our pick of practice. If I just use my, my test location, just to throw in there the new onboarding elements. So it's up in the our administration tab, invite user to practice. If you do you put a, a GOC number in there for a practitioner who already has access to Opera, then it will uh, advise you that they are already, in, or already registered with your practice. If they're not already registered with your practice and they are a user, you can add them to your practice. If they've never been registered at all, they'll go through a two-stage process. That process will be that they will have to do some uh, ID verification, so using passport, driving license, and the, using uh, the GOC register to verify against. And that will allow them access to the Opera platform. As a referral only practitioner, that's as far as they need to go. As a practitioner who wants to deliver commission services as well, when they gain access, they will go down to their, to, to their general tab, practitioner profile, and at this point to be able to add in the other certificates that we require for delivery of services. Okay, so really I think today from, from my perspective was enabled me just to touch on a couple of sort of sort of pinch points in the Opera platform of, of where we may be finding could be better utilised, particularly around images on the GOS 18 form. Um, sort of looking at finding the appropriate clinics for the patients and so working through that direct, direction of services on Opera. Um, looking at the SNOMED coding and how we ensure we're getting full information put onto our referrals. How we deal with triage responses and the notifications to deal with that. How do we reply in a, in, in a, in a format to those, to those referrals as well. But one thing I would just say is, I'm going to tell you a lot, um, but 
there are is also lots of resources on the GMLSC's website. So please, please do make sure you go onto there, go onto that referrals drop down tab, and there is a document in there uh, specifically in relation to referrals via Opera, which I'm sure you'll all find very useful as an on hand resource. So let's find let's find someone to refer. He'll do. So uh, the GOS 18 form, I mean, you're probably all quite familiar with this now, but uh, as I say, there was a, just a couple of points I wanted to make around this. Um, I think the first thing to talk about, um, and I'll just, just flip to the next the next screen, actually. Um, let's, let's, let's do it, use this one. I think the first thing to, to point out is NHS numbers. Okay, so obviously I've pulled my record in for the NHS spine, so I have got an NHS number associated with my, my record. Because we are now making the majority of the referrals in Greater Manchester through the electronic referral service, we are unable to make a referral to ERS, so to, to the hospital via that ERS platform without having an NHS number. So when you are when you are searching for your patient on your managed referral screen and, you, and you've put in your put in your details and your relation to your patient and you've you've put in your your name and, and date of birth and you've got and you've hit search and you've found, well, um, you know what, I, I can't find this patient. Very glad I can't find this patient. I was hoping, hoping that uh, first name and surname weren't real. Um, but what, what I really encourage you to do is a, a try and take at least two or three attempts to try and find that patient in the system. If, we, if you're unable to find the system, that may lead to a slight delay in this referral going. Because what we need to do is if we can't, if we have patients that are put onto the system without an NHS number, they go to the primary eye care services referral hub and they then have to go and find that NHS number on the spine. Now they empty that queue once or twice a day. But of course, as we move through the uh, evening, we're going to talk about emergency referrals that may need to be actioned very, very quickly. Um, and if we haven't got that information on that emergency referral, then we will really struggle to be able to get that referral dealt with in the time frame that we are, we are hoping. So I uh, didn't mean to click on that button. It was not me. That's me. So Finding of clinics. Now I'm registered in Stockport, so I'm now just debating whether I'm going to be able to demonstrate what I want to want to demonstrate actually here. But I think one of the one of the things that we've got to be really careful of is making sure that the appropriate clinic is selected. Now one of the things that we're working on um, through with primary market services, LAHN, and, and the hospitals across Greater Manchester is looking at trying to create that directory of services and where where are referral types, what conditions go to which clinic. You'll notice that on our clinic type options, although quite closely aligned to the GOS 18 referral list, it is ever so slightly different because we are now working off the ERS list. Whatever you select here, uh, so, so for example, Cornea, um, it, will, it will populate the next list of providers with hospitals that have a clinic specifically with that clinic type listed. So if you for example, if you if you said, well, okay, I've got this cornea patient. Now I know uh, Bolton deliver a, a corneal service, but it's not listed. Well, that might be because on ERS they don't list a cornea clinic. And what you might find to find the hospital that you require is sometimes you might have to go to this not otherwise specified option, um, and that not otherwise specified sort of as it says on the tin is, is an option for hospitals to sort of more 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 sort of group their referral types into a bucket of, of no specific condition. Now I would I'd hope that obviously when we do know the condition that we are after and uh, then we will we will be choosing that option because that allows us that so for example in this case cornea because that enables that that referral going direct to the clinician the hospital goes to the appropriate clinician at the hospital for them to triage that referral the one that's probably more important to point out is our other medical retina and wet amd referral types so if i were to just select my other medical retina here now um what what we will what we will find and, and I think I'm just gonna say because I'm stop or registered and I don't know whether Emacs not showing on my other medical retina. Let me just come here instead. Yeah, maybe that's not why it's not showing. So not a great example. But what I was trying to demonstrate to you on here is that when, and I'm sure Jez will talk about it later, is making sure we select the appropriate clinic, particularly for macular. We've got two types of macular referral that can be made. Uh, referral to MREH macular service, which has 
the full OCT sent with it. So the full volumetric OCT will come to how we do those uploads of those in a moment, um, along with images of the back of the eye to enable that assessment and really streamlining that clinic, uh, ideally into treatment centers. If you don't have that ability to be able to export that full volumetric scan, um, then we do request that that goes to the EMAC service for that patient to be, to be seen um, for that, that diagnostic assessment prior to decision on treatment. Let me just uh, send myself for a corneal referral. I think the other, the other thing, and whilst I'm on this page, is the, the three little tabs here are obviously also going to change our different clinic types, or so different urgencies on our clinic types. If I were to select emergency without then changing to emergency services and emergency clinic, you'll get nothing populated. So there is a need if we're going to select emergency that we do select our two uh, emergency options emergency eye services, emergency clinic only, and then we will see listed those uh, acute services that, that patient can be referred to. So let me just skip through a couple of pages here because um, you, you all know how to fill this in. So I don't want to, um, presenters are more than welcome to jump in if they want me to cover anything on any of these pages. Um, so, Coding. So what we are trying to really do here is ensure that the information that we're collecting in relation to the patient um, is, is meeting the NHS standards around coding. So NHS has adopted something called SNOMED coding, which uh, is a uh, systemic uh, di sort of condition diagnosis, allowing you to select actually even and in this list here, you can select both ocular and non-ocular conditions. Um, but what this allows us to do is code that uh, referral type um, into that SNOMED catalogue. So as you start typing in there, you'll see as I did start typing corneal, it narrows that down to those conditions in the SNOMED catalogue that do have the corneal listings. When I finish presenting uh, a little bit later on, I will post in the chat um, the actual link to the, the, the SNOMED CT browser, so that the catalogue browser, so actually if you're struggling to find something, you can type it into there and find what, what, what is it named under within that catalogue. And then we can select which eye, and as I've also mentioned, if it's not eye related or general health, you are able to, to put that into, into the referral as well. Adding more conditions by using a little plus tab uh, on the side of there as well. Okay, additional boxes for you to type in. I'm sure you don't want to watch me type, so I'm not going to do so. Uh, little drop downs here of, of additional information that may be uh, useful for the referral that you're making. Um, obviously, if, if this was a glaucoma referral I was selecting, there will be a mandatory requirement to include the first four boxes here. So of our CD ratios, IOP measurements, panheric visual fields and disc features. If I was making an other medical retina or wet AMD referral, it would be mandatory for me to complete the macular features in relation to this referral. Right, images. Now this is something that we, we have found we've had some problems with. Now, some of those problems have been uh, in relation to the imaging software that you've got in practice. So actually how you actually physically export the image that is required that is going to allow you to send that off to the hospital setting. Some networking issues, you've got your, uh, your imaging software on a, on a separate network or non-network at all to enable you to access the internet to be able to send those images across. Um, one of the things that we are looking to do from a primary eye care services point of view, particularly as we, as we hope to be living more of these electronic referral systems across England, is, is working with those manufacturers to try and put together some help sections on the Opera Health Centre in relation to how you get the files out of that software. Uh, our ideal scenario, and if we're particularly going to concentrate on those full volumetric OCT scans, because that's the one that can sometimes be difficult to get out to machines, our perfect scenario is having a non-proprietary DICOM file pulled out of the system. Now we want the raw B-scan DICOM. Now I know um, people like Heidelberg and, and Zeiss, you can export a DICOM, but there is some proprietary markers still within that DICOM that don't make it meet the conformance standards. So it is possible, and, I'm, and again, um, I have spoken with colleagues across Manchester who do have Zeiss instruments, and we're just looking at putting together some screenshots of how we get those raw um, B-scan OCT files out of Zeiss and Zeiss form in it to enable you to upload those into the platform. 
Uh, NIDEC, I know NIDEC is widely used across some of our multiple uh, chains across England, um, but unfortunately that the NIDAC OCT currently doesn't have the functionality of exporting the DICOM. I am aware that Birmingham Optical Group are working closely uh, with NIDEC in, in Japan to try and look at uh, resolving that, but actually have worked closely with a, a third party um, uh, a third party piece of software that allows you to export that DICOM as a video file. And again, uh, Opera has the functionality to be able to absorb that video file, make it into a DICOM file, and then allow that to be viewed then at the, uh, the secondary care setting. I think one of the other things is actually how do we physically get the files up? We sometimes have some problems where people mention in a referral, I've sent the referral, or uh, please see images, but actually the images are not appended to the referral for uh, the hospital to, to view. And that is often due to two things I'm about to show you. So let me just find a folder that I have some images in. Um, handily called test images. Uh, okay, now I don't know what these images are other than being eye images, but um, so what is one of the, the best process to flow when you are sending a putting an image into Opera is, um, and we've probably got these slightly the wrong way around in the way that you view it, is, is label it first. Okay, so let's, let's for example, so I've got a fundus image that we're going to upload off the right eye, and that image was taken today. If I then drag and drop my image file into there, well, bad example, it's not spun the right way, that's, that's on my computer, not within Opera. Um, and what we will then get is we will get this, this, this green, uh, green tabbed image on here. So as long as we've got a green tab on the image, then we can be comfortable that, that is an image that is going to be uploaded into Opera. As we then put a second image in, we've then got these images that are saying, actually, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused. And the reason why the system gets a bit confused is currently we don't have the functionality to have two same named files in the, in the system. Now that might be the, it's a right eye and left eye, so it doesn't really matter. It might be actually, it's a different file type, so it doesn't matter. But actually what we would need to do, we need to click on that second one we've uploaded and rename it or change the date on it. So again, if we've got an image that we've taken from a year ago and the image that we've taken today, make sure that's labeled in there because that is also then gonna label it when we put it into the PAX system so that actually secondary care can see those date differentials in relation to those. And now as I click between the two, you'll notice that again, when I'm the one I'm not clicking on uh, is, is green. So if I were to upload those two, um, they would upload to the referral and I get a confirmation of that up at the top, say two files are uploaded out of the two that I had, had put in there. Now I chose some quite small uh, static images there to upload, um, but I, I could have, and, and we would have sat here and, and watched it for 20, 30 seconds. I've uploaded at this point those full uh, volumetric OCT scans there as well. So our macular scans, optic nerve head scans, whatever we would like to put into here. Um, we've, we've tried to sort of list everything that we, we may want to, to upload into here. Um, I think we have had a suggestion recently about a historic clinical letter. So let's, for example, say it's the first time that you may be referring this patient in, in, the, in the local area. They may have moved, moved from another hospital, moved from the hospital some years ago. So you want to provide them with that letter. Well, again, that's maybe something we just need to add. For the moment, again, um, you can you can just put a sort of PDF report on, on that so you can, can send it. I mean, although these are labelled, um, I'm sure our clinicians at the other end are not going to say, well, actually, that's a clinic letter, not a visual field plot. They are going to understand what it is, what it is you are sending. And at this point, we would then submit that referral. You do have the option to print the form here. I'll be honest, that print form of this section isn't formatted wonderfully because it just literally takes the form and puts it into a document. Really what we should be doing, if we want to keep a record of that referral for ourselves, um, I would suggest coming back to our, our managed referral page where you will see your completed referral and click on your little blue document tab uh, to be able to, to view the referral that you have made. Um, I suspect I'm going to be told I'm quickly running out of time here, seeing Robert's put his, put his camera back on, but just two, two further things I wanted to comment on. Um, triage responses. So if you do get a response from the hospital, uh, you get your email to the practitioner that made the referral and the clinical lead for the practice that has made that referral as well. And you will also get an updated response from the provider on that list. Now, let's, let's for example, say, um, and we've got a pretty good example that I've just highlighted here, that we actually need to please refer this patient to primary care GERS assessment. So we sent it to hospital, they actually say this needs to go to the GERS. 
two things. If you've got say team, you, you've got two options, just doing another one and sending it to GERS, or you do have the option of updating the episode and updating that referral to routine referral. I'm going to select hospital. I know I just said to GERS, but let's just say we so that we get our we get and what that will do is that will change your green completed tab back to a refer to HES so you can then run through the, the flow that you're used to with your red tab from your queues assessment. So there is that ability to, to resend that referral to another location if you get asked to do so. So um, thank you. Sorry, Robert, uh, taking up too much time, but... Um, no problem at all, Matt. Thank you very, very much. It's a really important uh, issue in terms of the image uploading. I'm sure there will be some questions later uh, for you, Matt. Um, but I think uh, we did start a little late as well, so that's absolutely fair enough. Thank you uh, very much for that. So we're going to move on now to a joint presentation uh, between uh, Paddy uh, and uh, Katie. And, and really this centres on the hospital uh, processes generally before we move on to talk about uh, macula and the emergency eye department. So I think, Paddy, you're first up, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, I am. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Um, I'll just give Katie a chance to uh, to get some slides up there for us. Uh, that's fantastic. So um, I think before I start, I'm only going to speak very briefly before Katie um, uh, runs through some aspects of um, how we process uh, referrals at the uh, at, at the other end at the eye hospital. Um, I'm going to start just talking through some of the challenges for referring primary care optometrists, and um, I think as a bit of a, a disclaimer. Uh, I feel a bit like a fraud um, talking to you know 60 people that know uh, probably a lot more about some of the challenges um, at the end um, uh, at the uh, at the side of, uh, of the primary care optometrist um, uh, making making referrals I have a day a week in practice um, and so um, some of the examples that we're going to run through and you can probably pop them up now Katie if that's okay um, are perhaps some of the sort of the main areas um, um, of, of perhaps challenges uh, challenge or frustration that we've uh, picked up along the way um, when getting feedback um, um, from primary care optometrists and, and it just goes to emphasize really just how important it is. Um, I don't think anybody wants to feel um, like they're, 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 they're a boner or, 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 um, or complaining but actually um, giving that feedback to say well these are the things that are, are, are difficult, these are the things that, that, that we find frustra uh, frustrating are, are the only ways that we're going to make those changes and, uh, and this is one of the real sort of driving uh, reasons why we've set up uh, sort of regular meetings between primary care services, the eye hospital, um, and, uh, and practicing uh, primary care optometrists to see what we can can do about that. So thinking about adjusting to change, obviously the last 18 months um, um, has been a daily, weekly change for all of us, but particularly um, in day-to-day -day clinical practice, how referrals are being made, new schemes and pathways, um, new referral systems such as, as OPERA, um, and, and that has required a huge amount of change for, 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 for optometrists making referrals. Um, and there's been a huge amount of change at the, at the hospital um, end in terms of how we receive referrals. Um, and um, uh, certainly uh, these things have been done at pace. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's not surprising really um, that, 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 that things are gonna need to continue to change and we're gonna need to respond to some of the challenges that that throws up. Um, diva demands, so I was going to put up a, uh, a picture of a diva, um, you know, Beyonce, um, um, who else did we, uh, did we, uh, did we, uh, did we uh, think of, uh, Mariah Carey, um, and I was thinking about getting Robert's face uh, superimposed onto that, but we just wanted to acknowledge the fact that we know that at Manchester that we're asking you to, uh, to pick pick some specialties and and that's different at other trusts and that adds on an extra level of, of thought and uh, we know that some of the the, the endpoints um, because of the process of how that that links up with the the, the, the other side of the hospital um, some of those endpoints have been really quite um, they've not been particularly clear and again uh, we've been trying to pick up and identify them and make them changes and to make them uh, more simple um, we're hoping that this even will be able to try and give a little bit more clarity about um, where sort of a appropriate endpoints might be, um, but we realise that, that, that that's not going to be possible for, uh, for, for, for everything. And so when you're trying to pick the rights of specialty, um, um, we're going to, we're, we're doing uh, some work and Katie's just started some work looking at producing some different guidance about um, which patients that you might send to which different subspecialty. Um, and again, um, you know, from the, from, from the point of referral, um, uh, 
I think we all appreciate um, there's not always time in a busy clinic to be looking up at big documents. So we're going to try and make sure that it's really easy and concise and easy to use. Um, and the reality is, is if you're unsure about the subspecialty, um, simply just pick whichever one that you think is going to be the most likely or the best option. Again, if you're unsure if it's dual pathology, um, I think about just making sure that it's really um, as much detail, you know, is put in the referral as possible, um, um, just in case that that patient does require two different appointments um, but also um, also um, it just means that we can kind of help you know um, be able to, to triage that as best as possible. In terms of perhaps some of the background and reasons why we um, why we we are um, using the system of, of of getting optometrists to triage patients into subspecialties, well, the first and main reason is because of the fact that um, we know that um, um, the, the the primary care optometrists in Manchester are fantastic and they're perfectly capable of being able to make uh, the decision. And what that means is that referral then goes in and gets reviewed by a subspecialty team at the eye hospital. So it means that whoever's going to be looking and reviewing that. That particular say vitreo retinal referral um, they're going to have all of the right expertise to be able to, to work out how we're going to best manage seeing that patient. I think that um, another challenge is, um, is how quickly do I need to refer my patient? What does the emergency, urgent and routine options mean on opera? And if I refer a patient urgently on, uh, on opera as opposed to as an emergency, well actually how quickly will that patient get seen? And, and if that's not clear, um, I think that um, um, most, most practitioners um, wanted to do their best for their patients probably are going to be tempted to try and refer patients slightly more urgently um, if it's not clear um, that that patient's definitely going to get seen. And so Katie's going to run through again what happens at our end to make sure that urgent referrals are seen uh, in the most appropriate way. Um, there's only so much time in the day for forms, so um, I think that it's probably fair to say that opera has been a huge improvement and step forward um, 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 compared to healthy. And healthy has been a step forward in terms of in terms of uh, the old school paper uh, referrals that I know um, were quite easy and quick to, to fill out, um, but they the, the sort of a lot of the practicalities meant that they just weren't ideal. Uh, I mean, reading my handwriting for uh, for, 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 for for one, um, and so opera's. Uh, operas certainly um, cut down on the time take uh, taken to complete a referral compared to, to healthy perhaps but there's still an awful lot of boxes options things to choose um, I think that Katie's going to hopefully try and cover um, some of the particular options to select that can be um, really quite important in terms of patient experience and patient journey to make sure that um, patients, for example, with additional uh, needs, get those additional um, needs and support um, 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 uh, when they come for that first visit. And so um, she's going to sort of focus on summarising some of the ones that are, that are really important to, uh, uh, to look at. Um, and I think that one of the one of the one of the real challenges is um, uh, for 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 for, for uh, referring optometrists is seeking positive feedback. I think that because of the the, the way that Opera now um, gives the option for um, for at the hospital end to provide feedback, um, I think it's very clear to all um, that um, that on occasions. Um, some of the people doing the triage and providing that feedback perhaps aren't aware of the fact that, that feedback's going directly back to uh, to the referring optometrist. Um, and I think, um, so for example, I referred a patient uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I got a response back saying referral rejected in block capitals. Obviously my feeling to that is, that's not that you know that, that's not ideal that doesn't really tell me what's what what's going to happen with this patient and actually a week or so later i've got a really nice helpful detailed letter which was fantastic and so we're doing an awful lot of work on educating um those triaging um referrals in the hospital to make sure that um uh, that the, the the feedback that they provide is constructive and supportive I think that sometimes when, particularly in the acute setting, because of the fact that um, people are responding very quickly, um, I think that um, sometimes uh, sometimes um, we've had some feedback to say that, that the feedback that optometrists uh, can get can sometimes see um, a little bit short or a little bit critical. Um, and obviously we do not want this to be the case. We want, um, uh, we want this brilliant new function to be able to get um, uh, quick feedback like that to be a really positive uh, step forward. In a sense, historically, the issue was uh, with, uh, with the hospital was not getting any feedback at all. 
we're taking a step forward that now optometrists um, are getting more feedback. We just need to make sure that that's the right kind of feedback and it's going to be um, useful, valuable and supportive. And so to make sure that, that, that this doesn't continue to be an issue, what we'd say is that if you do ever get feedback um, um, on a referral that you feel perhaps isn't, um, isn't as constructive as you'd like it to be, um, Wendy's kindly agreed to, um, uh, to, to, to collate that. So if you just feed back to um, Wendy with the patient's OP, um, I think it's I can't, OPR number, I think it is, um, and then um, we will make sure that, um, that, 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 that we educate the person giving feedback to make sure it's as constructive as possible. So I will hand over to you now, Katie. Thanks, Paddy. That's great. Um, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see so many familiar names um, all logged on to this call. And um, I often say to Paddy, I still can't quite believe that we just slipped in last year on the on the 6th of March, that neuro event where we had so many people all in the lecture theatre. I think that was the last time I was part of a big event. So it's nice to see lots of um, familiar names tonight. I thought it may be helpful to Can you just tell me if you can still hear me? You're back in the room there, Katie. We lost you for a second. We lost you for a couple of moments, but we can hear you again now. Um, you've, um, not got, you've not got a moving face, and so I'm suspecting your signal's not great, but we can hear you again. I might just, if I stop my video, sometimes it helps. I'll just try that, and hopefully you can still hear me. Yeah, we can hear I've you. I've got fine. a bit of a delay going on, I think. Well, don't worry about a, a delay, Katie. If you just keep on talking, um, you can hear me. Then, uh, then, uh, then you'll be fine. Perfect. Um, so we're going to give you, hopefully, a bit of helpful information about what goes on once you press send on your referrals and what happens at MREH, so you have an understanding of that process. Um, but I've just got to make clear from the outset that the information that I'm going to share about how we process referrals, um, this is about referrals sent to subspecialties, so those that you might mark as routine and urgent, and this isn't the process to some of our emergency services like the emergency eye department or to EMAC, where the me working hard processing all these referrals. We've got a brilliant team of clinicians who spend a lot of time reviewing the referrals that are sent in and working out how to deal with each of those most appropriately. So uh, probably a, a flow you might be familiar with. So you create your referral and you press send from Opera. That referral is converted to land within um, the MREH area on the electronic referral service or ERS as you've heard it um, called I'm sure and this carries across all the details that you've inputted um, ERS for a bit of context is a nationwide system it's used by all hospitals across the country and it was introduced a number of years ago as a way of making all GP referrals electronically and it's mandatory for them to use so your referral lands into a number of our work lists within MREH. And as Paddy alluded to, this is where we become divas because we're asking you to put them into the specific subspecialties. And each subspecialty has their own work list. So hence we're asking you to, to make that decision. Each subspecialty team is responsible for triaging all the referrals on their work list. And clinicians in the team may take it in turns to do that, or in some teams, there's um, a few very hard working clinicians who are doing the main bulk of that triaging. And we aim to get all of the referrals triaged as quickly as possible. And we set ourselves a five working day target to triage the referrals within. So a nominated clinician from a subspecialty will come along on their day or um, when it's time for them to do their triaging logs into ERS and opens the work list for their specialty or their subspecialty. They can see the patient's name, a bit of overview information, and if the referral has been marked urgent or routine. 
Although it is worth pointing out that the list, in that list, you've got all the urgents and routines, they're not separated. They click into the referral and they can see an overview sheet, who's referred the patient, the patient's GP, um, your information about clinical examinations, tests that have been done, scans and images taken, and importantly, the free text field, which is certainly an important field for our triaging clinicians. The first decision that has to be made is whether to accept or reject that referral. So whether that patient needs to be seen in a hospital eye service or not. And then is there enough clinical information as part of this referral to make a triage decision on this patient? If we reject the referral, we may provide guidance back on maybe how you can manage the patient yourself in primary care. And as Paddy said, we'll make sure that we're continuing to work with our clinicians internally to make sure they know what, which message is going back to you and to make sure you're getting the advice or, or the detail that you need. We might also reject if not enough clinical information has been provided. So that will mean that we can't make a decision on who needs to see that patient and in what time frame we need to see that patient. So that means you'll be asked to um, re-refer the patient. If we accept your referral, we have assessed from your information you sent us that there is a need for hospital care. We then study that clinical information to see what time frame the patient needs to be seen within. And we make this judgment based on the clinical information rather than just that label of routine or urgent. We may not always agree with the label of routine and urgent, and we do have the option to change that once we receive the referral. And that is often done either routine to urgent, urgent to routine. So it is important for you to know that sometimes that happens. The biggest tip I can give you about urgent or routine, particularly for urgent, is make sure the clinical information that you're inputting supports that urgent label. An urgent label referral without the clinical information to demonstrate that a patient needs to be seen in that manner won't be booked in an urgent appointment. The set of urgent appointments we have available to us or the triaging clinicians have available to them are really precious and we have to allocate those appointments to patients who really need to be seen within a specific time frame because they've got something time critical going on. We then label or outcome the referral, and this enables our admin team to process the referral in terms of arranging an appointment, so the next step. We have the ability to highlight the referral to the admin team as urgent or as routine. If we label this as urgent, this tells the admin team that they need to book an appointment within a six week window. We also have the ability to label a referral as urgent and specify a time in which we'd like to see the patient. So it might be labeled as urgent and then the clinician may also highlight, book within four weeks, book within three weeks, please put in X clinic on in two weeks time. So sometimes there's a bit of extra detail for the admin team to action. If we think this is a routine appointment, the patient gets added to the waiting list for the next available appointment in that specific clinic. Now we arrange our routine appointments six weeks ahead of time. This is part of our wider MFT trust outpatient standard. And we believe that this is a reasonable amount of time to give patients notice of an appointment so they can make arrangements such as trial care or um, time away from work. It's also the cutoff period for our clinicians to book their annual leave. So this six week window means we will know who will be in clinic and therefore how many patients will be booked in. We're constantly pulling patients from the waiting list and booking them in six weeks later at which point we send the patient a letter to confirm when their appointment will be.
that was the overview of our internal triage processes. And I'd just quite, quite like to quickly touch on some of the vital additional information that you can highlight as part of a referral. And this is just um, a, a request and to say, please do use the options you have to highlight if a patient might need transport, needs an interpreter, needs an advocate, has a learning disability. And actually those are just a few examples of, of the boxes you've got available. And our understanding is within OPERA, there is a section called patient factors and you can tick various boxes to indicate um, certain factors about that patient. A real particular ask here is about patients who have really specific needs and for whom we need to put adjustments into place for. We need to know about these patients at the point of referral so we can start our specialist processes and make sure they have a good experience in clinic and that that clinic appointment is successful. And we have a number of options open to us within the hospital that we can put into place. So as an example, some changes that we might put into place if we knew we had a child coming to see us with an autism diagnosis. We might try and arrange ahead of time a side room where they can wait so it's quieter. Try and book them into a first, the first slot of the day, the first appointment, so there's no waiting around and, and time to become agitated. We have the option to send a storyboard out to help them prepare for what will happen, who they'll meet and what our hospital looks like and the clinic that they'll be seen within looks like. Um, our orthotic team have worked really hard on this and there's a number of storyboards that we've got that would suit different age groups. Highlighting this key information all also enables us to make contact maybe with the patient, their carer, um, a parent ahead of the appointment to see what things we really need to get right on the day. We want the patient to be comfortable, but also from experience, we know that if we don't get it right, the appointment's not going to go very well. The patient is likely to become distressed and it often means bringing them back to another appointment. And we know actually from parents particularly telling us that, unfortunately, if there's the patient then becomes distressed, it doesn't just last for the period of that appointment, that distress continues. So please do use all the tick boxes available on Opera to tell us about the additional needs of, of your patients. And we also encourage the use of your final free text field if you feel that you want to expand with additional information that might help us. There might be observations that you make during your examinations or details that the patient or their carer or parent um, tell you that you recognise as important passing on to us. So I hope that's given you a, a useful insight into some of our internal processes and how we um, look at all your referrals and particularly all the information you share as part of the referrals and how valuable that is in shaping what happens to the patients when they're referred to us. But also a, a big thank you because we know you've all put in a lot of time composing and then sending these referrals to us. And also your patients coming back and, and maybe asking questions about what's happening in, in really busy practice environments. So hopefully that context will help you um, know what goes on, but also able to um, share that information with patients and answer questions when I'm sure they, they come back to you. So thanks, that's great. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Katie, uh, and to Paddy as well. Katie, your Wi-Fi was holding out very nicely there. Uh, we just missed a little bit right at the very, very beginning. Um, we're running slightly late, but I think it's reasonable in the context of the presentations having plenty of detail and hopefully lessening the, uh, the need for lots of questions. But we will make time for those questions. Next up, we're going to move on to making effective referrals in the context of uh, macular. Uh, disease and um, without any further ado I'm going to call on Jez to share his screen and presentation with you. Thank you very much Jez. Thank you Robert. Let me just find the correct presentation and hopefully you should have a screen up now. Yeah we do Jez, that's looking good. Excellent. Okay. What I'd like to do is spend about five, 10 minutes just talking about how we can try and make 
more efficient macular referrals. You have four pathways open to you. Q's macula, EMAC, medical retinal, and fit for retinal. And depending upon your patient and their presenting signs, it would be nice if we could pick the appropriate pathway. So Q's macula. Basically, please use this if you can send through a full volumetric scan. A scan you can scroll through. Now I know lots of you are absolutely great at identifying the right part of the OCT, the relevant bit. But unfortunately, somebody might send us a bit which we then look at and it looks absolutely fine, but just adjacent to that bit of retina on the next bit of scan is something which is needs treatment. And if we've got the full scan, we can scroll through it and check exactly what's going on. The scan needs to show an urgently treatable lesion. In other words, wet AMD, myopic CNV, or an RVO with macular edema. Send us the extra information, fill in the extra boxes, because we want to be 99% certain that patient needs treating. In other words, tell us about the onset, the symptoms, and a bit about the patient history. Because if you use this pathway, the patient is going to be booked directly into a treatment clinic. It'd be really nice if you could give the patient a bit of an insight into what the likely treatment is going to be. So if it's a wet AMD or a myopic CNV or even an RVO with macular edema, it's most likely going to be an intravitreal injection. And if you've told the patient this and pre-warned them, then it's not going to be such a shock when the patient turns up. The original idea behind Q's macula was to set up to set a pathway up which would reduce visits during the acute phases of COVID and lockdown. But it's still a very, very useful pathway and it does get your patients in quickly. We review the Q's macula input at least two or three times a day. And if a patient's appropriate, we can just walk them straight into clinic and they'll receive an appointment. We then have EMAC. A lot of EMAC's been running for a lot of years. Uh, I think it started off as a Mark clinic and became EMAC about seven years ago. It was Mark about 15 years ago. It's basically, if, you've got, if you suspect pathology but needs urgent treatment, you don't have an OCT. Or if you've got an OCT but you're not quite certain of a diagnosis. The patient seen really rapidly. We'll see them within three days normally, unless the patient chooses otherwise. At the appointment, the patient has history and, symptom, history and symptoms done by a checklist. They'll have visual acuity, log mark VA. They'll have an OCT, and they'll also have an OCTA. OCTA is the latest kind of version of OCT, and it's almost analogous to a fundus fluorescein angiogram. It gives you an idea of blood flow and it enables us to diagnose much more accurately and see if a lesion is active or not. You could just have a macular cyst, but no activity, in which case we want to monitor it. An OCTA allows us to differentiate between those. When the patient comes in, they'll have a primary triage by the ophthalmic science practitioner. We've got two or three of them who've become very, very good at identifying treatable lesions. If they feel a patient's wet AMD or a treatable lesion, they'll just pop upstairs, talk to the consultant on MTC, get an opinion from them on the day, and hopefully we'll treat that patient on the day. So don't think of EMAC as being necessarily slower than Q's macula, because quite often patients are treated on the day. If the patient isn't found to have a treatable lesion and isn't treated on the day, then go through for an optometric review, which we do virtually, and that's always done within 24 hours. And that means we can then triage a patient, those that need anti-VEGF, we can put onto the system, those that need other interventions, we can put them into the right clinic with the right kind of time frame. Medical retina. It is basically all non-urgent medical retinal referrals. In other words, DMOs, RVOs not involving fovea, CSTR. Please remember, if you send an RVO to medical retina 
ask a GP for your blood workup and let us know on the referral that you've done this. If you send an RVO to EMAC or to Q's Macula, it would be really nice if again you could ask for a blood workup from a GP and let us know that you've done it so we don't have to do it again. Don't think that if you send somebody to medical retina, it's always going to be a long time before they're seen. But as Kate has already said, these referrals are triaged generally within five days. And if the clinician going through the triage feels a patient needs seeing urgently, they will upgrade that to an EMAC referral and will pick it up within a day or two. The fourth pathway is vitroretinal. Basically, these are patients who require a surgical input. So epiretinal membrane, if the patient's symptomatic and wants treatment, let them know what the treatment is. Let them know they can have a vitrectomy. Let them know it's surgery. So they can make an informed choice as to whether they want to refer. Macular hole, the same kind of thing. I'm just gonna run through a few recent EMAC patients just to give you a flavor of what's been coming through, what's great, what maybe could have gone through a different pathway. So if we look at this patient PR, they were referred on 16th of June, suspect bilateral wet AMD, 69 year old female. We didn't actually see them for six days because they chose not to have an appointment when it was offered. When they came in, VA 615, 675, one of our wonderful OSPs recognized the features of wet AMD, popped upstairs, consulted an input, and the patient was treated on the day. They actually had bilateral anti VEGF, I think it was ideally in this case. The ASIM, which was interesting to notice, this is the right eye. And if you look at your standard OCT, you've got a bit of subretinal fluid, some intraretinal fluid, you've got a fibrovascular PD there. Then if you look at our wonderful OCTAs, Basically, this works through the retina and looks at the blood flow in various parts. And in this area, it should be a nice black, nothing there, but that is actually a choroidal neovascular membrane. And that looks a fairly mature one. I think that's been going on some time. So this sort of fits in. The patient noticed the right eye had been blurred for several months, but because they were shielding, they didn't present immediately. And if you compare this appearance, if I can get my pointer back here, of a neovascular complex to how the left eye looks. So the left eye again, we've got a bit of subretinal fluid, we've got a little bit more subretinal fluid here. There doesn't seem to be much intraretinal changes. We've still got a reasonable foveal profile. And if you come down to your CTA, there is a tiny, neovascular complex just starting to come through. You have to look several times to pick that one up. <coughs> so this is probably a much more recent onset and we'll probably have a better outlook with this patient. Uh, if you'd seen this patient and you got these OCTs, this would have been a great patient to send to Q's macula. Nothing wrong with sending it to EMAC, but again, it could have gone Q's macula and that would have been fine. So we her on JB. This patient was referred 19th of May, flame hemorrhage in the right eye, VA 6666. The patient's got no symptoms. Their motivation, unless it's really well explained to them to turn up to hospital, is not that great. They canceled two appointments. We eventually saw them 14th of June. <coughs> About a month later, they're asymptomatic. They've got good vision. You look at the OCT. It's pristine, it's a really nice, good level RPE, nice foveal profile. I couldn't see any sign of a hemorrhage. So we discharged them back to the GP and advised GP to have, uh, we discharged them and advised GP to do a blood workup for them. <coughs> if you'd seen this patient, perhaps more appropriately would be a routine MR referral and a note for GP for bloods. And if you do a routine MR referral, there's nothing to stop you including images or OCTs if you can. The more images you can send us, the better. The better we're able to triage referrals you send us. 
My final little example is somebody seen week before last, a 78 year old male, recent left eye cataract surgery, reporting an increase in distortion. If you look at it, 6, 9, 6, 12. So yeah, you'd be suspicious of that left eye. So you'd be thinking, ah, you'd be thinking post-op CMO, near vascular membrane, or maybe dry AMD. But if you look at the OCT, if you'd got the OCT and you could have done that in practice, there's no sign of any intraretinal or subretinal fluid. You can see a little bit of atrophy here. And if you look, the signals coming through and the RP is very thinned. So it's atrophy, drusen, it's dry AMD. Manage it in practice if you're happy and confident to do that. We've just produced a little aid memoir, a quick reminder to help you look at OCT images and just to highlight the features which make us feel these are patients we want to see quickly. I've got to give many thanks to my colleague Nikki for making this. We're going to get this up on the Opera website hopefully in the next week or two and also get it on the GM Locks website. So it will be there as another thing just to help you make your referrals. Conclusions. Opera offers us a way to share information in a way we couldn't have done before. Images, OCT files, etc. Please use the correct pathway. Definite treatable lesion, full OCT file, cues macula. Not certain, no OCT, but high suspicion of a treatable lesion, EMAC. Because that still gives us a rapid access and an OCTA. Non-urgent medical retinal pathway, still going to be triaged and can be upgraded. Non-surgical to VR. One final slide. I have to give thanks to Romy Chabra, who's the lead consultant for MTC and a great guide and very optimal friendly. All the consultant team are. Nikki and Rosie have helped me with producing this. The EMAC team who work far harder than I do, a mode, Tom, Tipali, Leanne, all the MTC staff and all the ophthalmic science practitioners who work with us. Just one final thought. 15 years ago, we ran two and a half MTC clinics a week, treating about 15 patients. We now run 40 clinics a week over four sites, treating up to 700 patients a week. Patients are retaining vision, in the past, the outlook was bleak. When we all work together, we can make these outcomes even better. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much uh, for that, Jez, and a uh, really important final message there about the massive change in landscape uh, uh, in terms of uh, macular uh, treatment potential for our patients. Um, Helen, I'm going to turn to you because I know that you're going to talk about uh, making good referrals insofar as uh, emergency eye departments concerned. It's something that Katie was touching on a little bit in her presentation. So um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Let me just find my presentation. Share my screen. Fantastic. So many of you probably um, have had feedback from me because when we set up our EED RAS um, at the height of the first lockdown, um, when queues was introduced, we set this up in such a way that we actually um, provide feedback to all the referrals that come into the, the, um, the emergency eye department. So we don't actually um, make those patients an appointment. We just provide feedback to you guys to offer advice on you know, what to do with your patient. And obviously at the height of the first lockdown, patients were scared to come into the hospital. Um, if they could be treated closer to home, then that was fantastic. And it gave us a great opportunity to give you that advice um, and um, kind of follow the spec that NHSE put out uh, right at the very beginning. So when you're deciding, you know, what is an emergency, there's very good guidance out there. The College of Optometrists have got it in their um, clinical guidance document. The word emergency, you know, what is an ophthalmic emergency? Well, it, it, you know, there's no legal definition of this, um, but they have listed some examples which could be classed as an emergency. The Royal College of Ophthalmologists brought out some commissioning guidance just before uh, the first COVID lockdown in February 2020. And there was a clear definition of conditions that actually constitute an ocular emergency. So these 10 things, and, and some of them obviously are quite broad, you know, 
sudden pain, less loss of vision. Well, that could encompass a few different conditions, mainly kind of strokes or, or uh, artery occlusions. Painful loss of vision, again, can cover a number of conditions. Um, but these are the things that the, the, the College of Ophthalmologists um, classify as being an ocular emergency, which is sight threatening. So, so this is what we really need to see in our emergency eye department. And actually, you know, when Qs was introduced, fantastic service for us because prior to this, certainly in Manchester and Trafford, we didn't have anywhere to signpost our patients to um, because, you know, uh, patients, apart from having their duress sight test, unless they went privately, they couldn't be seen um, in the community. So we had to see them all. And it was very difficult in those pre queues days with having all the walk-ins to our emergency eye department and, and kind of sifting through, well, what is the dry eye, the blepharitis, because they came in too, and which you guys are keeping out of our department at the moment and and then looking and finding that needle in the haystack for that patient that is actually an ocular emergency and has a sight threatening condition so it's certainly um it, you know it's difficult it's a pressured environment and to to get to make sure that we're treating the right patients in the in the most timely manner and um, we need as much you know we need to be seeing these paid cases that are actually eye emergencies so we have come up with this is my brand new guidance chart and with this is just uh, literally due to go out for for circulation widely we have the other guidance chart on the gmloc website which is slightly outdated now because we've tried to put in some extra columns here because because we've got views and because you know you guys can see these patients in primary care um, and and um you know we've seen the numbers that a lot of patients are being treated by, by you guys out there and doing a fantastic job. Um, I've also tried to kind of add in, you know, a little bit of help, like Katie said, to make sure that we're picking the right specialities for the for the uh, urgence and the routine. Um, but obviously this chart is, it can only be so big, it's not uh, exhaustive. It was kind of intended as an, an aid man where something you could print out, stick on the wall, uh, maybe in A3 size, um, just as a quick reference guide but basically what when we're manning that EED RAS so for myself you know I'm in the emergency eye department I'm seeing patients which at the moment is is getting busier again so we we constantly we've got the e-referral service open on my desktop constantly clicking refresh seeing what what's coming into the work list so it might be that we can't respond straight away but what we ask you to do is get that referral uploaded on, onto opera first because if we can see that referral and we can see the tests we can see any associated images that's a lot better for us to triage and to make a decision rather than on the phone so we prefer it, and you've probably had advice back from our nurse practitioners, get your referral onto Opera so we can see it. Because the other thing that we can do is if we've got it up on our screen, we can also check our, our own in-house EPR and see if that patient's actually been in already or see if they've been to another speciality. Um, prime example, patient with um, hypertensive retinopathy, that patient we actually knew about because they'd been in the acute medical ward and treated for essential hypertension. So actually that patient didn't need to come to ED because we already knew that they had essential hypertension. So yes, they will have hypertensive retinopathy. They didn't need to come back to ED because we already knew that they've got hypertension. So it, it's really important for us if you can get your referral onto Opera. We will always send you a message back. It might not be straight away, particularly if it's out of hours. Um, but if it's daytime hours, we do try our best to communicate back to you on what to do with that patient. If it is one of those true ocular emergencies in the red orange column of the triage or one of the kind of definitions, um, then by all means, don't wait for us to, um, to get back to you. What we say is send that patient down, print the letter off, give them the letter so that they can bring it with them and report to our pre-triage. Um, but make it very clear that that's what you've done in the letter because when we're looking at our work lists, if we can see right at the top, actually this patient's already on their way down, we're then not going to kind of waste our time coming up with a management plan if we know that that patient's already on the way it's much better for us if you've sent us a patient and you think well actually I'm not quite sure what to do I just want a little bit 
bit of advice and guidance on what to do with the patient. I'm not really sure if they need to come to ED or whether they need to go to another subspecialty. We can then concentrate our time and effort on giving you that advice back on those patients rather than the ones that are already en route to the hospital. Um, so still put it on, but just make it really clear in those free text boxes that what you've done, you've told the patient to come down to EED um, or you're just looking for some advice on what to do with the patient. Um, and that's really um, what I wanted to say about that. Give us a little bit of time as well, because quite often you'll put your referral on and then you'll ring straight away. Well, like I said before, I'm seeing patients as well. So yes, I keep refreshing, keep checking it. But if you don't hear by the end of the day and you're really concerned that this actually is a site threatening condition, you know, send the patient down. But just let us know that, that you've sent the patient down, because I know it is always tricky to get through to our, um, our department. There is an, also a new telephone call management system in place, which I'm sure some of you have um, experienced. Um, the reason we had to do that was because those telephone lines uh, previously were being clogged up with patients ringing, chasing appointments, switch we're putting um, patients through who actually it was nothing to do with the emergency eye department, but they didn't know who else to put it through to. So those phones were becoming clogged up with non-emergency queries. So to, in order to streamline that, we've done this call management system so that actually um, clinicians like yourself who need some advice get through to the right person and, and patients chasing for appointments don't come through to the emergency, but go through to the appropriate clerical um, team. So what do you want to what do we want to see on those referral letters? And I'm sure, you know, when I'm giving my responses back, I'm trying to be constru as constructive as possible to say, well, have you thought about we maybe you haven't included, which would have helped us in our triage? So <clears throat> history and symptoms. In fact, a lot of the time, especially with the Q's referrals, I'm actually looking at that first line in the first box of the screening form. What has the patient said? Why have they been in contact with you? How long have they had it? Is it a sudden onset? Which eye is it? Any exacerbating factors? Do they wear contact lenses? I need to know that because I know on the Q's referrals forms, you've got lots of free text boxes. Um, you know, we want to know what that best corrected vision is with a pinhole. We want to know what the pupil reactions are doing, what their fields are doing, even if it's just a confrontation. Um, eye movements, if it's applicable, what's the pressure? And also, because of the cues forms, the way it's set up, um, this is all in the free text. Um, we want to know how you've measured it. If it is a pressure problem, actually, that we don't even know what the refraction is. So we don't even know, you know, is that patient really hypermetropic, which makes them at risk of angle closure blockade, or is the patient really myopic? On the GOSS form, obviously, we can see you've got your space for refraction boxes, but on the Q's one, not so. So even just putting that refraction in, you know, so that we know actually that could be potential uh, angle closure. Use diagnostic drugs. How many times have I seen um, unable to examine the patient because they're in too much pain? Put some anaesthetic in. It makes it so much easier. That's what we do as soon as they come into triage. If they're in pain, we give them some proximeticane to put in. So it makes the examination a lot easier. Um, use the College of Optometry's Clinical Management Guidelines. They're really good. You can get the app. I've got the app. Always looking up on there. Um, or Google. It's okay not to know how many times have we dilated a patient, sent them out the room so we can do a bit of a Google search. There's no shame in it. Um, and, you know, and our, and our trainee doctors all the time on Google looking because it's better to be sure, ask a colleague, ask a friend, rather than thinking, oh, help, I don't know what to do. There is guidance out there. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to kind of let you guys know, um, we just to give you a flavour of what happens when they come into the, into the emergency department. So basically we have a pre-triage system and that pre-triage goes through a number of set questions. Um, and this is a new kind of template that we're using at the moment for our uh, nurse practitioners. So we want to know, so this patient can be seen on this day if they have any of these symptoms. And then what we're going to do in that triage, triage exam is we're gonna check the vision and the acuity with a pinhole. Um, we're going to uh, check the pupil reactions we're going to you know assess the level of photophobia and you know are the eyelids acutely swollen if that you know if this is a red eye patient if they've got flashes and floaters we want to know you know have they got a history of high myopia have they got a, a family history of retinal detachment or a previous retinal detachment themselves so it was just to kind of make you guys aware of what goes on um, in our in our triage um at the eye hospital 
an acute loss of vision. They've got an acute homonymous hemianopia. Actually, that patient needs to be blue lighted to solve the royal stroke team because this, this is a really time critical. There's no point in a, a sudden onset homonymous hemianopia coming to the eye hospital. We're not the right people for them to come to. They need to go, <coughs> excuse me, to their stroke team. If it's a chronic loss of vision or a chronic loss of vision, we don't need to see in the emergency eye department. So none of that requires same day review. And then this was just another kind of form that we use for our nurse practitioners. Again, um, just to let you know what happens when a patient comes to the eye hospital. So if they've got a painless loss of vision, then we're going to be checking for an RAPD. So you might have seen a lot of my responses. Well, what are the pupil reactions doing? Is there an RAPD? Because if you've got a patient with hand movements, well, how do you RAPD, we check their colour vision, we dilate the pupils, and again, for the, the, the swollen discs or the, the double vision, RAPDs, colour vision, can't get enough of them. And I see Robert's come back on because I must have run out of time. <laughs> well, this is my last slide anyway. <clears throat> um, yeah. So you will all you will get a response back from us. Sometimes if if it's particularly if it's over the weekend, you may have found responses of my colleague Amanda and um, she picks them up on a Monday morning and gives you feedback. And, and actually, we try to do that if the patient's already been in and we've still got the referral sat on our work list, we'll let you know, you know, what has happened to that patient. And I think that's that's about it. Whistle stop till. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Helen, for that. Um, if you will uh, stop sharing your screen, uh, that's great. So um, a thanks to all our speakers, because that's been uh, really, really um, important. Lots of key messaging. Um, I know that um, I forgot to say, actually, that there was one CET point for the evening. So just a reminder on that. We do have a little bit of time for uh, questions. I know that uh, some questions have been answered as we're going along. Uh, in the chat. I don't know in the uh, the Q&A um, section of the uh, webinar format there. I know, Matt, that you've had an opportunity to answer questions within that. I don't know if any questions that have been answered, whether anyone wishes to pick up on those questions. Um, and uh, just in case there are people that haven't actually read those windows, um, because there might be questions that other people want the answers to, uh, unless there are any fresh questions that we've not dealt with, Paddy. Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, I think that um, Matt's uh, Matt's kindly replied to, to to the individuals. I'm not totally sure if everyone can see those uh, those responses. So I don't know, Matt, if you perhaps uh, if you if you're kind enough to uh, uh, to summarise uh, sum summarise some of the, the the responses. And so there's a question about um, about looking at the list for um, for post cataracts. Um, and that if there's new referrals, they'll be at the top of the list. Um, if it's a transfer um, from a different practice, it, it may not flag up. So. Um, okay, let me just log back into my demo site for you, which is a, not the best thing to show you on. There is, a, there is a document, I think, on the Help Centre, which probably highlights doing this better than I'm going to show you now, because I've not got any postcards on my demo site. You However... To, oh, you, you, you're too quick, Matt. I was going to say, do you need a minute? But you, you're already there. However, what the best way to navigate yourself around your, well, the best way currently to navigate yourself around your managed referral screen on Opera is to hover over the URN, uh, URN being your OPR number, but hover over the URN, change that to referral status and type in there the keyword that you're after. Now, in, 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 that will be post cataract or just cataract or cues or um internal referral, whatever that whatever that might be of the keyword that we're after that we're searching for. I know because I've got a glaucoma listed there. If I if I search for glaucoma, that will narrow my list down to those to those patients of that particular requirement. Now what is going to happen in the coming weeks? And we've still got a little bit of business as usual activity to get through onto opera um, for clinical service delivery. But once we've done that, we will be progressing with your login, not going directly onto this screen as it does currently, but actually going through to a dashboard where you will be able to view uh, those patients being transferred to you for postcard, those internal referrals that you've received, any pending referrals that have still got that red tab on them that you've not quite completed yet. Um, so just giving you a bit more of an oversight view. So that, that, that will 
that will come with time. Whilst, whilst you've got me, I am just going to answer a couple more of these, these questions, Paddy, if that's all right. That's um, yeah. so, so one of those, I think we have run through, Aisha. I don't know, apologies if you joined a little bit late in relation to, to how we get, get the images up there, but I think the, the key things are, are getting our green green tabs so they're labeled and then hitting our upload and then it will as i say you will get that that confirmation that's been uploaded or not if it doesn't work first time just just keep trying and there shouldn't be any reason why it's not unless there's something uh, corrupt with the file that's trying to be uploaded uh, but as i say opera can pretty much absorb any file you throw at it um so so there, there should be the functionality for you to get a successful uh, successful completion there's one about roles and responsibilities, which we've not really touched on a lot tonight, because again, we, we probably want to work a little bit more with some of the national um, support organisations, so FODO, AOP and, and the college, really just to get some support from them as, as electronic referrals roll out for them in areas greater than, than, or bigger than Greater Manchester, um, across the country as the um, National Outpatient Restoration Reform Board like uh, are getting their electronic eye care referral services set up. We do need to really try and get those roles and responsibilities nailed down. But in, in my view, um, and as I say, don't take this as the, the hard line yet until we get advice from AOP and FODO, is that you, you are the referrer. Um, as an, and I think I, I mentioned in a meeting earlier on today that um, this is an opportunity where you've been empowered with that responsibility to make that referral. Um, so when you do get a triage response back, as, we, as, we, as you can see, I have some on my, my referral status here. There is therefore a requirement to follow through on the action that has been requested. Now, whether that is providing the patient with some uh, advice and support in relation to the condition you've referred them with, or whether that is actioning that onward referral. And that brings me then specifically to the question that has been asked about if you are a locum optometrist and, and uh, you've referred a patient and it's been rejected, uh, who manages and refers that patient? So when a triage response is provided, we provide that via an, email, an anonymous email, well, a, a non-patient identifiable email, to advise you to go and check a particular OPR number. Now that gets sent to both the referring clinician and the clinical lead from the practice where that referral originated from. So there needs to be a little bit of coordination between that, that local optometrist and the practice to ensure that that action has taken place. Now, whether that's an urgent action and you're not on the premises on any given day, I mean, Opera is available to access uh, via a, a, web, a web browser, whether that be home or, or, or wherever you are, should the practice be uh, accepting that you're accessing that off, off their premises, and that's a conversation to have. Um, and if it is an urgent re uh, referral and you're unable to action it, again, the clinical leave the practice will have been notified and I think it's just checking with them that that, that referral has been actioned. So there is a bit of responsibility uh, around that referral triage that is, is provided back to you. Thanks, uh, Matt. I think there are one or two other questions that have cropped up um, in the uh, Q&A section there. Paddy, I wonder if you'd be happy to field those to the right panel members? Absolutely. So what I will do is I'll run through uh, probably a question for Helen or anyone uh, here. Um, so is there, um, are there any alternative apps available for clin clinical management if you're not a college member? And um, so Amanda, go for it there. Um, you don't have to be a college member to access it. You can access it on the web page. So you don't need to be you don't need to log in to do it. So you can just do it on the on the app, not on the app, on the on the on the web page. So you just Google it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a question um, again, um, probably to Helen or Amanda, um, working in the emergency eye department. Um, um, and uh, uh, it probably is, is a bit of a theme from some of the other questions, and it's about kind of mending or adding messages onto the referral once it's been sent back. Um, certainly, we had a very long discussion about this today. We've had lots of long discussions about this today uh, over, the, over the last few months is how we can improve the advice and guidance function so that this, um, that, that, that this can be a, a, a improved upon. Um, I don't know um, who wants to, uh, who wants to kind of, um, uh, um, sort of talk about sort of what happens after a referral's been sent um, and what's kind of the best approach to do perhaps. Um, Helen, do you want to talk about from an emergency perspective? Yeah, I think um, from my experience of what we've had in, um, is basically just get as much relevant information in there the first time, so you get it right first time, so you're not having to ask for 
for extra information. Attach all appropriate images that you can, because if we have an image, it's so much better. I had a lovely image this week of a, a ghost vessel from, from one of you guys. Um, <clears throat> so again, that makes it so much easier for us to triage if we can see those images. Um, the other thing that I would say, and I don't know, um, I've had experience of, a, of, of us asking for more information and then just getting the extra information and the more detail without the original information as well. So that would be a bit tricky. So if we're going to send it again, we send everything again. It's because it might be a different person that picks it up and they won't really put the information on before. Um, I think we're struggling a little bit with the sound, Helen, unless it's just no, admired. I think it's my voice. <laughs> oh, Helen, you poor thing. I think, I think we've probably hopefully got uh, most of the uh, most of the, the gist. Uh, we'll let you get your uh, get your voice back, water. Uh, uh, back there, uh, there, Helen. Um, again, a couple of questions just about when a referral is rejected um, uh, as additional information is requested. Is there a way to add it, additional information um, or do you have to send it as a new referral? Um, unfortunately, you do have to send it as a new referral. And obviously, Helen... Helen, Helen makes the point that it's it, 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 this emphasizes that how how important it is to, to to put as much information in there as possible. Um, but let's be honest, we're all you know we're all uh, we're all human, and um, um, and sometimes uh, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes you need that advice to be able to know what additional information that you've uh, that you've got. And it is a frustration for people to then have to go on and spend the time um, doing uh, a new referral. And so that is something that we're trying to work on to make that uh, less of a less of a less of an issue and less of a burden on the referral. Um, so um, can I just can I just jump in on that one if 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 I may? Um, and this is really, I suppose, whether we can get feedback in the chat of whether there would be uh, interest from primary care optometry in what I'm about to show you. So we've been working with the opera team and, and Manchester Royal Eye Hospital to, to look at how we can improve some of that. Um, bi-directional communication and the reason why I mentioned would there be appetite within primary care for this is that actually when you get a response there will be a need to yeah go away find that information from your record and, and answer it and it's whether there will be a capacity and, and time to do that and I think I think personally it would be great but obviously I, I've, I've helped help develop this so if I'm just if I'm just able just to share my share my screen again actually so as, as has already been pointed out, what we often find with the ERS interface is that it, it's very, it's a, it's a very one one time hit. So either either you've, well, I'm going to use a very much uh, NHS acronym here, but we would would like to ensure that we get it right first time, but we don't always do that. So there is always a, always a need for, like Helen said, to say, well, actually, can, can you tell me this about the patient? What was that about the patient? Um, so we've looked to develop and hopefully going to pilot in, in the coming months the use of this as an advice and guidance piece. So it, again, looks like you're your sort of messaging apps that you might be comfortable using on your, your mobile phone. But again, this is just a similar approach to enable you to have that dialogue between the clinicians at, at uh, Manchester Royal and or other hospitals if there's appetite um, so that they can feed back. And that might be again, you know what, yes, send that patient in today. Thank you for the, the, the great first referral. Or it might, as in this one, be offering some advice and support in relation to actually from what you've described there, uh, what we suspect of having some previous history of herpes simplex keratitis actually you're probably better off well, sending it to an IP optimal or in this instance the hospital may be just suggesting that uh, a written order has been created for the patient and again here we get the ability to to convert that to a, a true referral if, if the hospital decide to do so uh, actually add further documentation to that so you can add images add documents um, you may get provided back a document from the, from the hospital setting as well so I'm just I'm just showing it you just so we can maybe get some comments in the chat about about thought and appetite if that was something that we were to to pilot uh, say that that will enable and, and overcome some of those elements that we were just talked about there about actually that that bi-directional dialogue through through the uh, the opera platform thanks thanks matt I'm, I'm certain there will be uh, plenty interested in that so we'll, we'll let people think about whether they want to make comments on that paddy i'm conscious that there were just a couple of other questions in the um q a there yeah, no problem. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, probably a question again for Matt while you're uh, while you're unmuted. There, there. Um, a patient referred routine to the hospital by opera um, by a different practice, then came to see this um, this um, this other clinician for a second opinion. Um, but she was unsure why she'd been referred. Is there a way of accessing that original referral left on the patient's opera? Give me a few weeks. Yeah. 
Uh, so, so, so yes. Yeah. So along with your dashboard, I talked about you having the, one of the other improvements is that single patient record. Yeah, so that single database where you'll be able to click on the patient, see any current activity they've got in the system. So are they pending actually a, a, a cataract referral that's been made or, or actually they're due to go back for a follow up for their cues assessment in another practice. Uh, so all that uh, is, is coming. Is coming. Brilliant. Right. Question for Jez now. Um, for EMAC referral where an OCT image isn't added, so assuming just through the usual EMAC referral process, it says to ring the telephone number. Uh, do we need to do this? You don't have to do that. But if you do ring the telephone number, you will be given the appointment time to give to the patient. So if you can, it's better to. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much in, uh, for that, um, Jez. Um, so we've got a question here. When I send a referral to another optical practice on the enhanced pathway, such as GERS or cataract, I find the referral does not show on the list of patients I have referred. Is this correct? I have phoned the practices in question who always confirm they've received their referral. So I don't know, Matt um, or Wendy, um, um, what happens to patients who basically get referred to another optical practice via um, by, via GERS or, or 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 for a cataract or GERS, and where can uh, where can you track down that referral? So it will show in the other optical practices work list, um, and the the record works through. I'm just wondering if when Matt said that before, that will stay visible as well when we get the one patient record. I do not know the answer because the developments are coming thick and fast. But at the moment, that's the right thing that they're doing. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, are there more there, Paddy? Um, we are nearly there. Two more to go. Um, so the demonstration regarding post cataract doesn't work. It works for the others, but not for the post cataract, pre cataract. Um, I'm not. Do they mean the video? I'll have a look now. I hadn't. We've not had that feedback. Um, I think that what might be better um, for, for that one is um, email us. Pop that in, yeah, just to drop uh, Wendy an email. That would be uh, that would be fantastic. Um, and apologies for me reading live because I've not had a chance to read this last one that's come in. Uh, in Danny, I'll let you read that last one and just comment back to Matt. There's a comment from Faye on the advice and guidance, which is very very positive. I'm sure you'd have read it, but just for the benefit of others that uh, she feels this would be really useful. It would feel more like collaboration between primary care and the hospitalised service and may reduce frustration about missing information and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, the appetite, I mean, we've seen this and discussed this and I think the collaboration is really, really important. We said that right at the outset, but it's gonna be an ongoing journey. Uh, and so uh, it's good to, good to get some positive feedback on your brief demonstration of what's around the corner there, Matt. So Paddy, that question. Last question. So um, in order to print, we're having to download onto the computer, open and then print. Um, is there a way that avoids having to uh, to have a download of left on the computer? And no. Um, as, as with most of internet internet based programs, yeah, you have to, to download it to get a PDF then to, to print. Smashing. Well, that is the end of all of the, the questions that have come through. So thanks, everyone, for, uh, for all their uh, all the questions. Thank you, uh, Paddy. So, well, it remains for me to, to, to wrap up. And what I'd like to do is to thank everyone, first and foremost, for attending, for giving up your summer's evening. I think uh, we've pretty much had, you know, approaching 70 people and the vast majority of you are still on the call. So it's particularly impressive. And I think what that does show is the strength of um, uh, commitment, really, to try to improve this process uh, for, amongst all of us here. And that's what it's going to take. Um, this, this is, a, as I was saying at the outset, uh, an important time for eye care and this digital solution makes a potentially a massive difference to all of us. Yes, there are frustrations and difficulties, uh, but by working together, we can sort of uh, overcome these issues. And this isn't just a one off. Uh, we're going to continue to work together and try and collaborate. And we'd like to see a fruitful partnership to try to improve the processes. And part of that, of course, is continuing this feedback loop. Um, so I would encourage you to 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 write to Wendy, to write to Matt. Uh, to write to ourselves in the eye hospital, particularly Katie James, our referral relationship specialist, uh, and to Kevin Liu and, and others in their capacity at the uh, LOC level. Uh, and uh, finally, to thanks to all of our speakers who've, uh, again, really given us some great pearls of wisdom, um, have spoken very, very clearly, given some great messaging. Um, and so uh, thank you all. And uh, we'll conclude and finish you off. Uh, and just by saying, though, that hopefully this is uh, going to be made available as a recording 
Uh, obviously, that's uh, for, for those of you who want to listen again at some point because you think there was some pearl that you missed and would like to revisit it. Uh, and if there is a way of getting the the slides from this evening, which I know contain useful information around what to refer and et cetera, et cetera, for example, in terms of maculars. Um, um, if you missed a slide or two, then hopefully we can uh, make sure that that's made available. So thanks again, everyone, uh, and enjoy uh, the rest of your evening and time to get some supper. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>